and they come up with the answers to solve their problems. The week after that, the collection point at Jerome, Idaho, one of the best facilities of any of the collection points around the country, had weeds growing up in it, hadn't been used for I'm not sure how long. The next week they opened up that collection point and we moved three loads of cattle through it the same week. All those people have divided the areas up out there and are doing the work themselves. We're parading a whole crew of people up here in front of you that will never that will never accomplish anything without every one of you pitching in and helping them. Clear over here on the far left, Ron Shaw. It's kind of a story all of his own, actually. But Ron and I were both living in Omaha and we're very good friends. Ron is a subcontractor framing houses there. Ron, a year ago at this time, couldn't have talked to you about the National Farmers Organization because I'm not sure if he had ever heard of it. He definitely could not have talked to you about cattle because the closest he had ever been to cattle was eating a T-bone steak. When I hired Ron, I had to spend quite a bit of time with him, but I don't believe there's ever been anyone in the industry group as much together in so little time as this man has. The next man, Gerald Cox, brought with him to the organization the rapport that we definitely needed in that area of southern Colorado, and New Mexico, and Arizona. I was out there, and we had a meeting in Monta Vista, in Monta Vista, Colorado. It would definitely impress every one of you the type of respect that he has with the cattlemen around that area. It definitely impressed me. The very same with the next guy, Don M. Sandy. Don is probably one of the harder working men in the organization, on the staff. But Don has that same type of respect with the cattlemen and the industry out there. He wrote an agreement for us up at Glasgow, Montana, that is the best cow agreement the state of Montana has ever seen. On the end, Joe Salm, that, that's <laughs> a year ago when I went to work with Walt, we were traveling around the, the Midwest mainly to meetings. The meetings were very tough in a lot of areas but every time we got into Wisconsin, then they were a lot of fun. We had taken the same program that y'all had had for quite a number of years. But we had taken it, and a year ago, Walt Hackney told everyone at the convention how he wanted to see the system operate. Well, everyone had the same opportunity. But Joe Salm took that system and in the state of Wisconsin put it to work exactly the way it was written a number of years ago. Probably the only man that has ever done that. Now, like I said, we're not parading all these people up here in front of you. Except we're hoping that through this meeting, the feedback that we'll get from you is going to help us in dealing with the farmers and ranchers across the country. 
Dwayne just stepped in the door. Dwayne Wind from Illinois, he's a cattle supervisor for the state of Illinois. I would just assume that we would open this up now and start out with questions or if you have some suggestions. The people, you can direct them at anyone or a certain area you might want to pick out one of these people. Excuse me one minute, Steve. I want to, I want to, before you start, um, Sandy Wilson here is a, a real benefit to you as an organization. And I can't help but look at Sandy and see how pretty she is and then think in my own background of what I'd have done as a rock-headed old tobacco-chewing packer when someone like her come in from the National Farmers Organization and asked me if I wouldn't bend a little to make a little better trade for the membership, I wonder what my response would have been. <laughs> I think I know. And I think that Sandy deserves a hand because it's tough for a girl in a packing house. I don't know how many of you ever been in one, but I'll tell you one thing, it's no family picnic and she's in there wading blood and guts to her ankles across that kill floor. I went through the kill floor and area with her at the Tolera plant. Doesn't bother a bit. And you know what impresses the man that owns the plant that probably loves her like a daughter is the fact that it doesn't bother her a bit and she's there and she's all business. And I'm really proud of Sandy. And we've got another girl in Mealman plant in Sioux Falls, South Dakota that just started and is doing the same work. So you see we're, we're in the E, what is it, the E? What is that called? What is it called, Sandy? You know, the, where the women are, women are equal and the men are sorry for it or something like that. <laughs> anyway, we got no distinctions because I can assure you that her abilities in the state of California are as equal to Don M. Sandy's or any other plant rep we have across the country. And she has that same respect of that membership out there. And they depend on her to carry the mail for them in that packing house, and she does. And I, and I think that you've got to be impressed. I, I know you're impressed, as I am, with the youth that we have going now but more importantly, much more importantly, is their potential for you and those members you're representing here today in the future. Because we don't have to stop and regroup and retrain now for a long time in this department I'm referring to specifically. I got people here now that are as good as gold and will last as long as you will and longer but it's up to you to keep them a coming. There's a lot of young fellas in this room, and if you like what you see, and I'm not talking about Sandy necessarily, <laughs> but if you like what you see going for you here today in this cattle division, there's two things I want you to do. I want you to think about what might be your involvement with this organization, specifically cattle, and specifically going to workforce, but I want you to also come back here Thursday and hear what these people have really got to tell you. I can't seem to emphasize it enough uh, how proud I am of these people and more importantly how proud I am of that program they're going to present this Thursday. Now, Steve. Open her up. In that Thursday meeting, Bobby Cox from Montana will also, she will be the first speaker you'll hear. Bobby just walked in. I think you need to give her a hand. Well, we've thrown uh, quite a bit at you and maybe boasted a little bit. There's got to be somebody sitting in this room that either doesn't believe a thing we've said 
or has got maybe some advice. Did, did y'all hear what he, the question? The question was, stop me if I, he asked about the checkoff and if the collection points take all the checkoff or if we have another system to use. Are you also getting at the pay back to the farmers on how long it takes and No, I don't believe uh he asked if there was any packers anywhere that collect the check off. Something that I thought was part of your question, but it wasn't, was uh, on uh, the time it takes when the check goes to the collection point, they take the check off off and then shoot that check to the producer. Something that I am not going to stand for is these people that call in and uh, and say they've been waiting two weeks for a check on three old cows. It's completely uncalled for and and I'm slowly trying to speed this up, change the system. A, a packer in Wisconsin, or in Washington, I mean, Welch, I've just started the deal there with our man out there, John Satterley. And all the payment on cattle area is going directly right out of the packing plant. But our man does the paperwork on it. That way, on, depending on how I sell the cattle, if the cattle are sold live, he pays for them the moment the cattle arrive at the plant and are weighed up. Flatten the beef, he pays for them the next day, and grade and yield, it's the third day. There was a question about U.S. beef, the brown cattle and race horses. I uh, just wanted to make a little bit of a comment about the cattle program. I've never been more impressed with the expertise of the personnel involved. Again, I noticed uh, fellows from Wisconsin do on the end of the That very well put, and I'm sure there probably isn't anyone in here that disagrees with you. Because Joe, like I said, is the, about the only one in the country that took the system and run it exactly the way it was written. And it's definitely been a success for him up there, for the people in the state of Wisconsin. 
but also the rest of the people sitting up here come to work for the organization for a reason. And it wasn't that your reputation was so fantastic that it drew everybody into it. So, yeah, I see what you mean. But everyone else up here, and there is more people than just us, definitely had some very deep feelings for coming to work for the organization. Surely some more questions. I would hope that we've either not done that good a job or that that you definitely I have, have a question, Bob, but it pertains just to my area. So, uh, That's fine, Harry, because I think some of these other people would like to know what... Uh, well, I wish they'd come and sit high with some dogs. <laughs> Harry, uh, I've heard this comment from Harry, and I've heard, I've visited with people that Harry has visited with about this problem. This is a, it, it's, an, it's an extreme problem. The reciprocities and so forth that these truckers have are, to, it doesn't make, I think somewhere in the back of my mind, Harry, and correct me, is it required that you have the reciprocity, if that's a correct term, on your own vehicle if you're hauling your own cattle to the packer? Is that, a, is that correct or not? All right, sir. I, I, all right. Now, Harry, because of this, it, it's not a criticism of the National Farmers Organization. It's a condition up there that's affecting his ability to produce. So he brought this up. The first I heard about it, at least, was about three weeks ago. Maybe Virgil Miller. Oh, uh, I'm not, uh, maybe, was it Ron? I really, Ron, Ron, all right. Ron, mm -hmm. Ron about <clears throat> mm -hmm. Well, the, the thing we've done to, you see, we try, we try to counteract. Now, in southwest Minnesota, there's only one physical, local, so to speak, packer, and that's uh, Wilson and Company and Albert Lee, but from Harry's area, He's got a certain amount of freight disadvantage, plus the fact that I don't like our working agreement over there. So between the two of those, we're kind of restricted there on what we get done. Now, Harry made a more valuable comment, though, to me as a bargainer at the same time he was discussing this problem out of Minnesota. He made a comment that because of these problems and because of the fact that cattle freight was less going into Sioux Falls, South Dakota to John Morell and Company, if, which we did not have, if we would get an agreement with John Morell and Company, it would in fact attract a lot of these very cattle he's referring to that we're losing because of this thing in Iowa it would attract those members. They want to go through the organization, but monetarily they don't feel they can do it. So, Harry, I don't think you know this, but one week ago, 
A very close friend of mine is a corporate head kettle buyer for John Morell and Company, Tom Malcolm, in Chicago. I called Tom, and I expressed this exact problem that you brought up. I said, I don't know that we can do business with Morell, but at least we feel that we have a volume potential over there that you're losing, possibly we're losing, that y'all can have if you'll negotiate a decent agreement with us. So Harry Tom asked me if I would, in fact, write up a proposal and send to them, which I did last week. He hasn't, of course, had time to get back to me, and then, of course, with the convention, I've not had time to talk to him. But he found over the phone really no problem with that agreement we have with the Dubuque Packing Company in Lamar's, Iowa, where Harry's referring to, he's shipping these cattle. Now, that's what has been said here today about cooperative communication. We can work it as constructive as we can destructive. You see, I didn't know Harry had a problem because I'm not aware of all these reciprocities across the country. But Harry was aware, and he voiced his opinion, and while he was voicing his opinion, he also came up with a constructive way to handle it in getting an agreement with Morrell. I didn't think we needed one. We had a plant in Sioux, Sioux City, we had a plant in Lamar's, Iowa. Uh, you know, you can get saturated with packing houses. But in his case, with the proper agreement, I feel confident, and I think as Harry does, it will attract thousands of cattle through our program that we currently are losing because of this thing coming back and forth into Iowa. So you see the importance to the organization of close ties and close communication. And Harry DeVos, as I said earlier, is the premier in Collection Point people. He's a thinking person. But you people, obviously, apparently, are also considered to be thinking people. Otherwise, I wouldn't think your membership in your localities would have delegated you to come to this convention to represent them. So when you go home, think. Think what you can do, like Harry DeVos has done. Think what can improve. Now, I'm not going to spend a time a day with you if you complain to me about a cancer-eyed cow that got condemned in some damn packing house. But if you can show me a way that we can increase volume in your area in thousands, like Harry has said, boy, I'll go to the mat for you and with you, and we'll have what you need. I just wanted to fill in on that, Harry, because I knew you was bringing it up, and I knew Steve wasn't as aware of the thing because I happened to be one that handled that one. And uh, I wanted to tell you about that so you can take it home with you, Harry. We're in there. Uh, quite frankly, I think we'll have what we want. I haven't had time to talk to Tom, but I will when we get back to home, okay? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if any of you know this other young man that just came in here. He's a trainee in the organization. His name's Staley. <laughs> and ordinarily... Uh, uh, well, I'm just going to ask you to say something, I guess. That's what it came for. Good. By golly. Why don't you come up here? Thank you, Walt. Well, well, though I heard of the discussion here, it's great. Now the responsibility goes on you with a contract to get the volume. And that's the way it's working. The position that I believe that this organization is in is a position that I never thought we would get in until we had master contracts because I'm not afraid to say publicly, which I am going to say and have been saying, but the meaning behind it is even greater than what I'm saying. I believe that almost without exception, the NFO members are getting the best prices available to the farmers in this country. And there's very few exceptions. We need two things. 
One of them's pride and confidence, and the other's contacts. And I have one goal in this convention, to give you a preview, that we send an army of producers out across this country like nobody could ever imagine. To back up those programs with volume, and backed up with volume, even greater achievements can be made in the contract. It's pretty hard. Walt's done a miraculous job. And you can tell the difference, Walt, every place that you've got the additional volume, what you can do. You know, you can't do much with a wheelbarrow full either. But I'm very pleased, but out of this convention, that army of producers. You know, we've had the conventions and everybody cheered and stomped and they went home and everybody thought everybody else was going to do something. Nobody's going to escape this convention. It's showdown time for everybody. I believe we can achieve the March 1st, first date. And I have no other intention than to lead and if necessary, drive, push, to reach it. So I've got a little sheet of paper here. And if there's any way to sign a blood pack, I guess this is what we're going to do. I got to be careful about my terminology, you know. And that is that it's a little sheet of paper that everybody that's a producer in this convention or otherwise <laughs> starts out by signing their name. And underneath that, they're going to list five other people that we're going to have to give an explanation that is not on here that have, to their knowledge, has not been contacted in the last year. You know, this little chummy bit of going around talking to the same people and visiting with the same people is not going to get it. We've got to expand ourselves. And it's going to say the name, the address, the county, the phone number, if possible, the type of production, the amount of production. There's five spaces. And you better remember those names because you're going to be held responsible for reporting back if those names are not on through our accounting department, that they're not on something that has come through the organization very shortly and be called to see if they have been contacted and what they said. And if you failed on one, you're going to be asked to replace that one. It's showdown time. We've got it just almost where we can touch it a total victory we saw. And we all leave here. No longer do we go out and saying, yep, hold up our hand, we're going to do it. This time, when we go out of here, we're going to have a piece of paper of a signed commitment. And we're going to make it pretty miserable, to be right honest, for anybody that hasn't gotten it. About all we can do is just be as ornery as we know how, you know. Call, ask, and we got plenty of telephones and plenty of people. And I'm not going to be asking anybody to do anything I don't do myself. Because I want Christmas off, or I'd like to have next week off, you know. If anybody's worked longer hours than I have, I can step forward. I don't want to, no, I'm not sure I want to compare with Kent and Bailey. I, yeah. I, I got to talk to him. He's got to let up. I wish we had to talk to more people like that. But I'm determined, the most determined I've ever come into a convention because we've got it in position. Oh, I know there's going to be a few people, like I got a letter the other day talking about how bad the cattle department was. I also got to report what the cattle looked like. And I know what the guy did. 
He went out and picked out those odd heads in a sale barn somewhere. They were low goods, and he thought that at least half of them ought to have been choice with a 100-day mile of feet, you know. Well, we're going to have a few of that, and we're going to have a few things like that happen. But I know that most of the people in this country are losing $20, $25 a head on their cows and fat cattle. They're not going through the NFO. And so that's all I got to say. I hope it's good news. But you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference to me whether it is. Everybody's going out here. No longer saying, yep, uh, boy, we're going to do her meaning somebody else is going to do it. This time we're going to know who's committed to what. Glad to be here. That's just the beginning. But I think we're there where we can shove it over the hill and be the proudest group of people that overcame the biggest odds anybody ever overcame in this country. Thank you. Glad to see you. Um, thank you very much, Hornley. You know, there's a, there's a thing in this organization, I was sitting there thinking about it when he got him come walking in here and was talking about it. <clears throat> you know, I've come out of the, of the packing industry, as I've said a hundred times, but what I want to say is this. I don't think that you as members can possibly appreciate what I'm going to say as much as I appreciate what I'm wanting to say. I've attended all kinds of stockholder meetings in the corporations, and they were big corporations. I have attended conventions with those corporations, and I have had meetings similar to this, but from a different side of the fence. And I've never had the president of my corporation bother or be willing to take the time to come into my meeting and get up with what I feel are my people and express himself as Orrin Lee. Now, what I'm really wanting to say is over in Corning, that was probably one of the first things that impressed me if I was impressed at all when I initially came with this organization was the compatibility that everyone has to the member with whomever they want to talk with in Corning, Iowa. It's an excellent rapport and it's a thing that you should take advantage of and it's a thing that you should encourage your members to take advantage of is this rapport thing I'm referring to. We're starting to run out of time. We're getting close to lunchtime. I promised myself I was going to eat dinner at about 12. I have a man here in a corduroy jacket that when Harry and I were discussing this transportation thing, had his hand up, and I'd seen Orrin Lee come in, and I didn't intentionally uh, ignore him. Did you have something in your mind, sir, that you wanted to discuss with us? Right here with the corduroy jacket. Did you have your hand up a while ago? This, this gentleman, I led him into that. I apologize, Ken. I knew who he was. This fella is, what's his state, Ron? Maine. There you go. He's from Maine. Kenton has worked harder, I guess, than any one individual in this organization. And before Kenton makes a statement here, I want to say one thing very quickly. In your hand, Sandy, when y'all came in, gave you one of these that Ornley discussed. I didn't know he was coming over, so I was going to fill in. I'm not going to have to go through it now. I hope you understand how totally important this is to me. And probably, in my opinion, less importantly to the whole organization. Because the cattle 
division, of course, the only one that counts in Corning. You all know that automatically. But I need this. I really need your input. When you leave here, I would be totally indebted if you would have it filled out and if you would give it to Sandy as you exit down there at her table where she is. Kenton, thank you for being here. Here's a man that has created a, a problem health-wise for himself because of a 250% oh, commitment to a cause. This is a loyalty thing you're going to hear from now. It's got nothing to do with salaries. It's got nothing to do with personal gains. It's strictly a cause. And I have heard of him ever since I come to this organization. I met him once uh, back in the winter in Corning. And I have heard all the stories that you can hear about a man that is totally committed. Kenton? Well, I like to be involved in something with other people and I realize that if you are to succeed in anything that you do first of all you have to tell people what it is that you want them to get involved in and I've never been able to accomplish anything myself until I got other people involved in it and I like to set up in the back row rather than stand up here on the podium now this is probably contrary to what that gentleman down there from Kentucky thinks and what some of the rest of you think around here, but uh, we find in our area that it is demanding that you get people involved. We're so far apart from our neighbors, meaning right in the state that we live in, we don't have very much production in any one county as farmers. We need the National Farmers Organization in order to survive and so we spend time, first of all, selling the philosophy, and then we go out and show the people what the mechanics are, and then we get them to understand, first of all, if it's going to succeed, all these things have to work together. I've seen people try to sell the organization on the mechanics. I've seen people try to sell the organization on just the philosophy, and it always ends up failing. It's putting the whole thing together. We got involved in the National Farmers Organization in the spring of 1967 in milk holding action. Then the first time we got involved as far as the mechanics go was when we started selling cull dairy cows and bob calves in May of 1968. We built it because we didn't have a milk program through 68 and 69 and into 70 and we had a pretty decent meat program but then it began to fall apart because we didn't have this word expertise, we didn't have custodial accounts, we didn't have those things, and many of the buyers looked at us in the weak points and began to exploit those. Well, a year ago, July or August, we started in rebuilding our meat program. Now, remember, I told you we aren't very big. We like to sell humility. We like to sell we need everybody else. And then your head doesn't begin to swell and get out of proportion with the rest of your body and you tip over and you find yourself laying on your back looking up because your head got so big. Give you an example. We've always believed in the whole organization. I believe as a dairy farmer that the meat program is an absolute must in order for the dairy farmer to enjoy success in the meat program. I've learned and I've gone back and told other people, and I don't like using that word I, even though you'll hear it, because I'd rather say we and us because it's many, many, many times more powerful and more successful. Because if you get a lot of us's and we's in this organization, the I doesn't have to do so much. If you start talking about the I, you build a program and it comes up to a pinnacle. And then you wonder who the I is. We build it the other way around. We put the I down on the bottom and say, okay, I'll go out and get two more people. And get those two more people to get four more people. And those four people to get ten more people and so forth and so on. The next thing you know, you're beginning to make progress. I'll end this up with facts to show you how this works. But anyway, a year ago, January, i got to go back just a little bit farther than that. In September of 1975, six of us farmers got together and went to a bank and bought a gooseneck trailer and a truck to haul it 
And we had a program where we took cow dairy cows and took them to a slaughterhouse, ground them up, sold them, and, you know, through the NFO ground beef program. And we heard people saying, that's wonderful. I'm getting 10 cents a hundred, uh, 10 cents a pound or $10 a hundred more than my neighbor. And ha, 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 the NFO is success. Well, that's not success to me. Talking about how I'm getting more than my neighbor. And what was the price? Well, the price in January, the sixth day of January, I drove that gooseneck truck and went out and picked up some animals, took them to a slaughterhouse. I was the plant rep because the guy that drove the truck got the opportunity to be the plant rep. We picked up the check at the plant, sent it to the Rochester office. They took it and spread it out over the people that had the animals on that truck, and we got on the top side of animals, culled dairy cows that dressed 800 pounds, on down to culled dairy cows that dressed 400 and some odd pounds. On the high side, we got 12 cents a pound less than my father did in 1949 when I was a sophomore in high school, and whoop de doo now ain't that something. You can stick your chest out, you can pat yourself on the back, and you can kick yourself in the rump while you push your nose on the grindstone a little bit harder and go broke a little bit faster. That's not what NFO was designed to do. We kept talking and working with some of the other people in the program, checking with them how NFO was succeeding, which it naturally wasn't, because if the overall price doesn't come up and you don't make progress by getting more people involved and get more production, you're going just one way, and that's right straight down. So sometime long in August, we decided to become part of the whole organization again. And in September of 77, we loaded up a possum belly, load of cattle and calves and a few steers and a few dairy bulls, and we sent them out to Utica, New York, through the whole NFO. Now, let me show you the advantage of being part of the whole NFO. We got the advantage of having a plant rep. We got the advantage of being part of the whole meat program by sending the meat through the money through the whole custodial account. We had little custodial accounts, but you don't enjoy the uh, advantage of having the protection of the whole if you're off here by yourself. And then we went down those country roads after we knew we had something that was good by saying, now look, we've got the part of the whole backing us. And we began to, began to explain to people that the reason why the milk industry was predicting a tremendous drop in the price of milk this past spring was because last, a year ago, last fall, the cull dairy price was so low. But that was because the feeder price in Montana wasn't so good. In Missouri, it wasn't so good. And that was because the fed cattle price in the areas where they were converting grain to meat wasn't so good. Now, if you're going to make it work, we all got to do our share. And that begins with me doing my share. Now, I'll step off the subject for just a second, but be right on the subject. There was a man once born in this world, and he said when he left to go out and to love and to teach, and most important, was to do. That meant I could ask you if I would show you an example of me doing, because I have no right to ask somebody else to do something unless I'm willing to do it myself first. So we went out, and again I say I don't like I. I like to say, come on, Walt. Come on, gentlemen. Come on, ladies. Let's go. I'll take the first step and the second step, and then you take the first step and the second step, and we'll get so many people marching in the right direction all together at the same time, there's no way anybody can stop us. I'm not out here as an NFO member or an NFO paid staff personnel or as anything else in NFO to destroy the meat industry, the milk industry, the grain industry, or anything else, or the consumer or any of the middle people in between. I'm not against them. I want them to make a profit. But I have something else. I want the farmer and the rancher to make a profit also. I want to turn around a system that's built from the top down and build it from the bottom up so we all can survive. I'm against something. That's right. It's a disease called low price itis. It grabs you in the checkbook, in the wallet, 
and back there on the farm and the ranch, and it completely wipes you out as an individual. Well, if I'm against something, what am I going to do? I want to replace an old system with a new system where farmers and ranchers can get involved and get equity, full fair cost of production plus a reasonable profit so we all can survive and the consumer can eat three times a day. And that if that means that I as a farmer and an NFO member and a staff person has to give something a little bit extra to get it done, so what? That's what the people did that came.